All right, John 13, we're going to pick up our, uh, our class here. And remember, what we're talking about is Philadelphia, the church at Philadelphia had an open door before them, and the Lord said nothing negative to them. He said everything about that church was positive. It's only one of the two out of the seven that had good things like that at all. But Philadelphia means brotherly love, and we're told specifically that one of the things faith does is it produces brotherly love. It's a proof of faith. It's a proof of salvation. Now, don't let the devil enter in at this point and say, uh-huh, don't you still hold this against that person and this person? Keep things in context. Love your brother, right? Love your brother as yourself. Did Peter love his brother as himself when he denied the Lord? No. Did Peter go to hell? No. No. Folks, this is something that starts and it grows. All things in the Christian life start small. A grain of seed, right? Mustard seed. But it grows. Now this is what the whole subject is here. But let's just compare what everyone said on this. And again, I showed y'all that love is the fulfilling of the law to show you that if we're told to love our brothers and to love God, then we're told to keep the law, aren't we? Period. Not Moses' law, God's law. Now, let's see what the Lord says. In John 13, 33, He says, Little children, yet a little while am I with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whether I go, you cannot come, so now I say to you. Now notice He called the apostles little children. Were they all little kids? No. But were they little in the faith? Yes. Folks, this is proof that they've born again already. They're Christians. He said, verse 34, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, not as yourself, but as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, by this love towards the others like this, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. Then is this true brotherly love a sign of something? Sure. It is. And folks, the world's supposed to see this, aren't they? But what's the condition in the church today? Folks, it's, it's, it's the same as the world. So what does the world say? Look at that. Look, right. at that. Look at that. Now whose fault is that? Folks, that ain't the world's fault. That's our fault. Again, the doctrine got confused. And as soon as the doctrine said all the law's gone, forget about it, the church quits paying any attention to the, do to the laws, didn't they? So naturally, what's the outcome? Lawlessness? Lawlessness where? In the church. Well, if the church doctrine got wrong and their practice followed, how do you straighten out bad practice? You straighten out the doctrine first, don't you? And that's what we're looking at. Now, that's the Lord saying this. Go to John 14. 14.21. I want to show you all two components here. Number one, He says, Love the brethren. And then there's the flip side, Keep commandments. Now, in all reality, it's the same statement. It, it's, it's the exact same statement. Let me show you what I mean. John 14, 21, Jesus says, <clears throat> He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. He that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, not, not Judas Iscariot, the other Judas says, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself to us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him and will come unto him, and, make, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Now folks, this is not to get saved. Only a saved person can do this. Then what does he mean, I and the Father will make our abode with him? We'll dwell with him more and more. We'll come settle down and dwell in that person more and more. Well, then what does that indicate? We need more, don't we? Yeah. He says next, 24, He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. So what Jesus is basically saying is, talk is cheap, isn't it? And you know, he, I joke with Lexi, and I, Pam, if you're watching, don't get mad at me. Pam will get on me if I say something about Lexi. But I joke with Lexi, Lexi say, I love you, and I say, oh, well, talk's cheap, you know, but a good meatloaf now, that. You see, that's a joke, but what I'm saying is, show me, right? Well, what's the Lord saying? 
You can say a lot of things, can't you? Did no. he say, you'll know my disciples by what they say? No. He said, watch, okay, what they do, watch. Now, let's go keep looking at another one. Look at John 15. Now, all of this is the night before he died. Do you think this was important to him? The night before he died, folks, in John 13 through 17, we don't have any other Gospels. You've got the Lord's preaching to His disciples the most pertinent things. And what's the center of all of it? Love. Love. Now He says in 15.12, um, This is My commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Is that the Lord's commandment? Yes. Imagine Him saying that. And saying, the night before He died, here's my commandment, but that commandment's going to stop in a few weeks, or in three years, and then I'll start that commandment again over here. Would that make any sense? No, it don't make any sense. He says, uh, uh, I done lost my verse here. Where was that? 15, 12, okay. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Do y'all see how that's greater love than you have for yourself, isn't it? Now the Lord explained this to us in, through Paul in Ephesians 5. How did Paul tell a man to love his wife? Like himself. As himself or as Christ loved the church? Right. And gave himself for And gave himself for it. Folks, a man is to lay down his life for his wife, isn't he? You know, it's one thing to lay down and die for. That's a lot easier than laying down your life and living for her, isn't it? Mm -hmm. it is a, it's a whole lot different, folks. This is how a man is to love his wife. I've had two different men tell me something that I experienced myself, and I was glad to hear it. The first one was Mr. Bailey. Y'all all know Mr. Bailey. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bailey told me that he said he loves his wife more today than he did last year. She's been dead for six years. He's still growing in love and missing her, isn't he? But he told me, he said that he read Ephesians 5 one day years ago, and it hit him. He said, this is not a suggestion. And it didn't. You know, men read it and say, you ought to love your wife. Well, I'll try it. It's a command. Love. He said, and I decided right there that day that I've got to love my wife. And he said, that changed everything. I had another person tell me the same thing. I keep talking about John today. I guess his birthday was this week and he's on my mind. But John told me one day that he finally realized when he, he just reading his creed, he said, you know what? This is about love. The more excellent way is love. He said, I'm told that I've got to love Don like Christ loved the church. He said, that's what I'm going to do. And folks, the man did it. I watched him do it. He taught his kids the scriptures. He, I mean, the man really got busy doing it. Why did he do it? Because he felt like doing it? Because God said do it. He was commanded, wasn't he? Well, we're commanded to love each other. Well, then what do we need to do? Let's get on with it. it. It ain't as hard as we make it out, is it? See, what makes it hard is we think that we ought to love those that are lovable. Don't we? Well, let me ask y'all, how lovable are you? <laughs> and you see what I mean? <laughs> Folks, I know one thing. It takes a lot of grace. It takes a whole lot of grace to love me. I know that truly. I'm not making a joke. And when I look at how Lexi loves me in spite of me, it makes me love her all the more. It's just, it, that's how love works. Now, why does any woman love her husband? The Scripture teaches us. She might lust after him or lust after or love the idea of being married and all, but why does any woman truly love her husband? Because he loves her. Because he loves her. Folks, y'all know, hey, y'all remember when Julia Roberts married that country singer? Oh my God. That was the ugliest man I've ever <laughs> seen in my life. And I'm not good looking, but that man made me look like Brad Pitt. And I thought to myself, how? Well, I mean, I'm trying to make it now. I thought to myself, how? And do y'all know she was just glowing with love? And you know what she did? Now, of course, it wasn't true love. It didn't last. But do you know what she talked about that day? How he treated her. She was in love with the way he was treating her. Mm -hmm. I don't care what you are. You treat your wife with love. And will your wife love you back? Yes. Yeah, she will. She will. She'll love you back. Mm -hmm. We're told that the only reason any of us can love God, any of us can possibly love God at all, is because He first love loved God. us. How do you know that love at first? Right there. Oh. You begin to see what He did for you. He sent the Son into the world. The Son was sent into the world 
to manifest the Father unto us, didn't He? That's why He said He came. Can we see the Father? God's a spirit. You can't see a spirit. Anybody ever tells you they've seen God the Father, they've not. Now, the Son took on flesh and manifested Himself. All His actions showed what? The righteousness of the Father. He was the righteousness of God in flesh and action, loving His neighbor more than Himself, wasn't He? He gave His life for us. Then He ascended up, and today He's at the right hand of the Father. So the Father sent the Son to manifest the Father, didn't He? The Son goes back to the Father, and still today He is manifesting the Father, but can you see the Son visibly today? No. Who did the Son send? Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. And we're told this, the Spirit will testify of Christ. Will the Holy Spirit testify of Himself? No. Who does the Holy Spirit manifest? Christ. The Son. And by looking through the Son, who are we able to see? The Father. The Father. How do we start looking? Everything we do start right there. Y'all think about shooting a rifle and looking through a scope, those crosshairs? Bring it all back here. This is the statement of how much God the Father loved us. Now at first, all you see is the love of the Son, isn't it? Think about it. You see Christ died for you, don't you? And you start to look at that and you look at yourself and more and more you wonder, how could He love me? I mean, seriously, me? How could the Son of God that created all things divest Himself of glory and come down here for me? I don't understand that. Could y'all imagine me going out in my front yard and laying down on an ant pile and dying for that ant pile so that the ant pile didn't get destroyed by the lawnmower? That would be insane, wouldn't it? It ain't half as insane as what Christ did. Only because we have so high an opinion of flesh do we think we were worthy. We're not worthy. Have you ever seen one of them ants abuse their children and, and curse God and blaspheme? But sinners will, won't they? So then, Jesus Christ performed the second greatest act of love that has ever been shown. He laid down His life for people that were not worthy to, to have anything, didn't He? Amen. Why do I call it the second greatest act? Because the Father The Father did the greatest. After a while of looking at that cross, it dawns on you one day. Yep. Wait a minute. For God the Father so loved the world that He gave His Son. Gave Him to what? To die. What would be better? Would you rather suffer and die for your child, or would you rather watch your, your, watch your child suffer and die? That's the greatest act of love that's ever been performed. And there it is, and this is how we come to know God, through the Son. And as we begin to see how much He loved us, what does it begin to produce? We begin to love Him back. He said everything, God in Genesis chapter 1 laid down a law of nature, Everything brings forth after its own kind, doesn't it? Well, what produces the love of God then? The love of God. Paul said the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. How? Through the words. Those words show us what Christ did. We learn about the Son through that book. The Spirit comes through the Word and manifests the Son to us. And as the Spirit manifests the Son... We begin to love Him, don't we? Mm -hmm. But how is all that working? He's putting the love in us first. We love Him because He loved us. And the more we learn about His love for us, what happens? The more our love grows for Him. In a true good marriage, you know, you see a couple, they're, they're 25, they just got married, and boy, they're all excited, and life's just wonderful. He, you know, nobody's had to, uh, nobody's had to, they haven't even lived together yet. They hadn't. She hadn't seen how he leaves the sink and, and you know all that seed up and all that sort of stuff. But you see them and they're in love, right? But you see them 50 years later. They're not goo gooing and gaga. They're not. Ooh, they're just sitting on the swing together having their coffee. She knows later on she's going to have to get help him with his change his diaper maybe. He knows later on he's going to have to take her to get her hemorrhoid surgery. And I'm not trying to be vulgar. I'm trying to show you all something. Do they love each other more sitting in that swing? Folks, they do. Why? Because their love has grown together. It's a mutual growing thing, isn't it? 
It's amazing what people, a husband and a wife, will do for each other in older age. It's amazing. And I thank God for it. It's an institution that He formed. We've tore it up. Man, we have tore up marriage. It's an institution of God, isn't it? And how is it meant to be? To become one. Uh, Paul told us, you love your wife as your body. No man ever hated his own body, he said, but he takes care of it and nourishes it. It said to the wife, you, what? Obey your husband. You know why you didn't have to tell the wife to love her husband? If the husband loves her, she's going to love him. She's going to love him, isn't he? Now, you know, every man that ever worked with in the shipyard knew that verse. What wives obey your husbands. But they always <laughs> forgot the other part. Is a wife told to be obedient to a husband that's telling her uh, contrary to God's Word? No, folks. When you've got a husband and it's contrary to God's Word, who comes first? God does. You don't, and we see that in Scripture, don't we? Hey, now, he goes, let's go on. In John 15, 10, he says, If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Look, it's the keeping of the commandments and the love. It's the same thing, isn't it? Now, he goes on. Look in verse 16. He said, You've not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained or appointed you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, He may give it you. These things I command you, that you love one, one another. Now, John 17, 26. Jesus is praying to the Father. The last words of His prayer say this. Verse 25. O righteous Father, the world hath not known Thee, but I've known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. Now, we read a verse earlier that said, if you don't know the Son in a, in a relationship, you don't know the Father. How many people do y'all know today that will make the claim that basically what they say is this, well, I believe in God, and that's enough. Is it enough? No, they don't believe in God. Uh -uh. If you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you don't have the Father. He says, verse 26, I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it that, or in order that, the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. Do y'all see what's going to make this possible? God does it in us, doesn't He? Folks, the same way that the husband creates that love in the wife, and I don't mean she don't love him at first, but what makes her love him more every day? He loves her. His, he creates that love in her by, by sowing love. And so what does it do? It produces love back. This is how God works. Now, let's go look. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ had to say. But y'all go over to 1 John. Let's see what the Apostle John says. Now, I'm going to give y'all some homework. When you get home, don't tell me you don't have time now. Nobody <laughs> say that, okay? But I want y'all to read the book of 1 John. Hey, I, I will tell you all, one of the main reasons that I love the teaching that I was taught at first is because it was able to take care of 1 John for me. 1 John used to bother me because I knew I didn't do it. I couldn't keep the things in 1 John. I didn't even want to. And so a man told me, 1 John ain't written. You don't worry about it. And it just took the load. Of the, I felt great about it. But folks, 1 John is written us. The whole book is about basically the same thing. Now watch what he says in 1 John 2, verse 3. Hereby we do know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. That's pretty simple, isn't it? He said, He that saith, I know Him, and keepeth not His commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Now that's pretty simple, isn't it? And again, the keeping of His commandments does not mean that you're going to keep the commandments flawless. Keepeth is an on present tense thing. It doesn't say he that kept them. Is it your desire to keep them? Yeah. Do you strive to do that? Yeah. Now, do we fail? And yeah. when we fail, what do we do? You go to the Lord and talk about it, confess it, and try again. You get up every day doing that, don't you? You know, does your kid, is your children, anybody got a young child in here? Yeah, Courtney's got one. Courtney, is your love for your child dependent upon their behavior? No. But do you expect proper behavior? As they get older, are you going to expect more and more mature behavior? Yes. But your love will never change, will it? Folks, that's how the God is. Right. He says now, verse uh, 5, Whosoever keepeth His word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. 
And by the way, perfected is present ongoing. In other words, it's happening, it's growing, it's being perfected. Hereby know that we are in Him. In Him? In Christ. Yeah. How do you know you're in Christ? Folks, if the Holy Spirit's working in you, you know you're in Christ. Now at first, lots of these things are hard to see, aren't they? And boy, the devil will enter in there and he'll jump right in there and say, uh-huh, you ain't got that, see there? He'll jump right on you, won't he? And what do you have to tell him? Hold on a minute. You're telling me that I've got to do this to be saved. I'm telling you that only a saved person even wants to do this. Now, do you want to serve God? Yeah. You see the difference? Then he says, verse 6, He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk, even as he walketh. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment. The Lord already said this. Which ye had from the beginning, the old commandment is the word which you had from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. Now, does that mean if you've got hatred towards someone, you're lost? No. But if you hate your brothers and sisters in Christ, that's a warning sign, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Now he says next, He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. How many people do y'all know today, right now, that are walking in a, in a dispensational doctrine that hate brothers and sisters in Christ, they'll attack them. Folks, I did it. I know. They'll be vicious towards them and hateful towards them, and yet they say, this ain't written to me. Now, why can they say such a thing? They've been blinded by their doctrine. Now, I'm not saying they're all lost. Can you and I be completely blinded to the fact of what we're doing? Sure. We sure can. Now, I, I understand this part. I know this well. Now go over to uh, verse 29. John says, If you know that He is righteous, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of Him. Notice doeth. Not does. Doeth. Now what's the difference? What does it mean to doeth righteousness? Right now at your goal, every day you get up, this is what you want to do. How do you make your decisions? Well, we need to make them based on what God said, don't we? If I wake up and I say, you know what? Tomorrow's Monday. I can get back to what I was doing and I'll worry about serving Him next Sunday. Something's wrong, isn't it? I'm not saying, hey, you're lost, but if you are saved, you're such a young Christian, you're right at the beginning of the walk, aren't we? You know, it's like a little child. How long does a little child mind? <laughs> I'll tell you all, I hear the same, same Things said every day. Did I tell you? This is what about, this is my life. Don't you touch that? Did I tell you not to touch that? Now remember Bill Cosby that routine? Yeah. Don't you touch that? Will you quit touching that? You know, it's just, but you got to tell them constantly, don't you? Now if you got a 15, 16 year old, and you do that. Something's wrong, isn't it? So it's, it's a growing process. Now look at First John three, verse four. Whosoever committeth Notice the present tense. Mm -hmm. Not whosoever commits a sin. Not whosoever fails from time to time. Not whosoever finds you have faults every day. Mm -hmm. Whosoever committeth ongoing, present, persisting, walking in sin. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. Mm -hmm. And ye know that He was manifested to take away our sins, and in Him is no sin. Do you notice it didn't say He was manifested to deliver us from hell? Right. He was manifest to take away our sins. Now how does He do this? When the person is first saved, bingo, right there that day, sins guilt. Is it gone? Yeah. Folks, that guilt is paid for. When will sin's presence be gone? At, at the second coming when you get a new body. You'll be done with the presence of sin then, won't you? Will you be done with the presence of sin before then? No. But in between, what does He work on? In our daily life, right. the power of sin. Right. The corruption. In other words, does He begin cleansing us? Yeah. yeah. Folks, He begins washing and purging us. And how often do we need washing? Every day. 
Every day. Every day. You are saved, you're being saved, you shall be saved. Paul said, we are saved by faith. He said, the day of our salvation draweth near. You see the two? And in between, daily salvation. In Matthew chapter 1, when Mary became pregnant, the Lord told her, He said, this child is going to call this His name Jesus, which means Savior. He said, for this child is going to deliver His people from their sins. Did He say from the guilt of their sin? From their sins completely. Will you stand before God with any sin? It's going to be removed, isn't it? The guilt's removed back here, and then what's He do? He starts purging us. And folks, this is an ongoing, lifelong process. You read those old hymns, these old time, that boy, they knew it. Everybody knows uh, Rock of Ages, right? Oh, yeah. Top lady said, uh, uh, that place have totally left me. <laughs> uh, I done absolutely forgot what I was going to say. Oh, he said, uh, be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. What did he mean double cure? Save from wrath. The moment you're saved as a child of God, will you be subject to his wrath? Folks, if you're not a child of God, the wrath of God is going to fall. That's just as sure as anything. He said, save from wrath and make me pure. See the two? Always together. Now he goes on and says this. Uh, let's see, verse uh, 5. He said, He know that He was manifested to take away our sins, and in Him is no sin at all. He says, verse 6, Whosoever abideth in Him sinneth not. In other words, if you abide in Him, we don't abide in sin, do we? Now notice, abideth, present tense. What does it mean to abide in something? To settle down. Literally, the word is to, take, to set your roots down. You know, we always talk about, I'm going to put down roots. What's it mean to put down roots? Make a home. Yeah. If you can make your home in sin and you're happy there, something's wrong. He says, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Now there are those that say, See there, if you commit a sin, you're not of him. Go back to chapter 1. In chapter 1, verse 6, John says, If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. He said, we walk in light. As He is in the light, we have fellowship with Him. So he's talking about fellowship with the Son. But look what the Apostle says in verse 8. If we, believers, say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Then do we still have sin? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then what does He mean over here? Uh, verse 8, He that committeth sin is of the devil. It's abiding. It's ongoing. It's dwelling. It's having no desire to be any different. To be just going in what I am. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. Has the devil ever had a moment of reformation? Has he ever had a moment of true repentance? Is there a lick of sorrow in him for what he's done? Has he ever had any desire but to serve self? There's the idea. He said, He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Notice you can, this is the manifestation. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Folks, if you can say of someone, he, look, I'm going to tell you all something that I heard a preacher say once, and it really helped me a lot. It, it set me free because I knew something's wrong with this. And all the people that, that, that I was associated with had the same attitude, basically, with the exception of a few. And he said to a group of people one day, he said, I don't have to love you to the people. He said, all i got to do is preach the gospel to you. It ain't my job to love you. He said, as a matter of fact, there's some of you here that I don't like and can't stand. Does that sound right? No. Some of y'all probably heard that statement. Folks, that woke me up. That said, wait a minute now, something's wrong with that. Something's bad wrong with that, isn't it? Well, basically what he was saying is it doesn't matter what you do, it just matters what you believe. Well, what does the Scripture teach? What you do is a reflection of what you believe. All right? So now we've got to go on in these things. Look what he says here in 1 John 3, 11. He says, 
This is the message that you heard from the beginning that we should love one another. He says, Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Don't you reckon Cain told Abel many times, I love you? And yet what was the proof he didn't love him? He killed him. Do you need to go say, well, he might have killed him, but that doesn't matter. He said he loved him. You see how foolish that is? He says next, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Notice, abideth, remains. And again, don't look around the room and say, well, I don't even know this person that good. How can I love them and all? Let me ask you, do you look around here, do you all see anybody in this room you hate? Do you see anybody in this room you wish evil towards? How about anyone you meet out there in the world that's a Christian? Do you really look at that person and not feel like you would do something for them? Folks, y'all know there are Christians right now in this world suffering like me and you can't even imagine. Y'all know what it's like to be a Christian in China? Read some of the stuff that comes back. Folks, in China, it's horrible. Art just gave me a book by an old missionary that, and I hadn't even started yet, but I read a few of the, the, the you know, folks, they go through horrible things, don't they? How about being a, a Christian in the Middle East? I'll tell you what, how about being a Christian in New York City? You're going to be at least laughed at, aren't you, ridiculed? Folks, this is around the world today. But he says, verse uh, uh, 15, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Now, didn't Cain and Abel both profess to believe God? Yes. Didn't they both perform religious ceremonies? Yes. We would put it this way. Weren't they both members of the church there in the garden? Yes. Outside the garden. Where they, they're both members of the church, both bring their sacrifice, and yet what was one of them? A tater, a child of the devil. How did, when did that become evident? Nobody knew it until that day. That day he killed his brother, and then what would somebody say? Well, ain't no way he loved that. No, no Christian would do that, would they? Now, I'm not talking about war or something like that. I'm talking about he killed his brother. Why? Because God accepted his brother and denied Cain. Y'all know I remember being little. I had to play with either the little kids or the old. I was right in between in the neighborhood. So I played with the older kids. Well, guess who was the last one picked for everything? <laughs> Me. You know I hated them? <laughs> I mean, I'm telling you the truth. I would sit there. I hated them. I would... I, mean, I remember telling them, but I'm fast, and I, they didn't want me. I'll be the last one picked. And how does that make you feel? When you're not picked, it makes you feel offended, doesn't it? Well, that's the way the world feels towards a Christian. They don't even know that. I've told you all before, I have a friend one time that told me about something that happened to someone he knows that says they're a Christian, and he laughed, and he said, I love it, I love it. And I said, why does that make you happy? Now, I was trying to bring... The man got caught doing something. He shouldn't have been doing, but whether he's a Christian or not, I don't know. That's not my thing. But why does it make you so happy that he got caught doing it? Y'all know why. Just yeah. like me. Exactly. You ain't no better than me. Now, isn't that how the world looks? Yeah. You know what's caused the world to do that? Christians have looked down their nose and said, I'm better than you. Yeah. Haven't they? Yeah. Where'd they get that idea from? There Wasn't is. from the Bible, was it? And what's the Bible tell us? I've told y'all many times, we're the man, all we're all sinners. Yeah. Old Paul got saved. And when he got saved, he said over here, you know what? I'm the least of the apostles. Now, I'd like to be number 13 out of 100,000, wouldn't you? That's pretty good, isn't it? Mm -hmm. He said of the apostles, I'm the least. He got to know himself better, and a few years later, you know what he said? Of sinners, I'm, I'm the worst. Before he said that, he said... Oh. I'm the least of the saints. Oh, yeah. You know, I thought I was number 13. I realized here of all the people that are saved, I'm the worst. He got over here towards the end of his life and he said, I'm the chief of sinners. Yeah. Now, did you really think Paul was sinning more than anybody? Mm -hmm. He was seeing his lack of perfection. He was seeing his sin. What does one sin do in the mind of someone like that? It condemns them and shows them their utter dependence on the Savior. John the Baptist said just before Jesus came, he said, when Christ comes, and this is true of everybody sitting in this room, when you get saved, when Christ comes, John said, I must decrease. He must increase. Now, is that not the story of the Christian walk? Yeah. Folks, that's what's going to go on. If you're saved, that's what's going to go on the rest of your life. 
And don't look at this and say, how in the world am I going to endure? Folks, this is a wonderful thing. You talk about wonderful to know, I can't do anything without Christ. And yet He told me I can do all things with Him. So if there's something He's got for me to do, who's going to have to enable me? He will. Thank God I don't have to depend on myself. I'm not trustworthy. I'm not dependable. Boy, my Savior is. He's never lost a battle yet, has He? Forty days He went without eating. Forty days. Folks, this ain't a fairy tale. Forty days, and then let the devil come, and the devil said, turn that rock into bread if you're the Son of God. He, I, you know, y'all know how foolish men are, especially men with pride. Tell a man he can't do something, and what his pride of life say? You look out. I've told y'all one time, my first time I ever had to go to a chiropractor. He, me and my buddy that used to work out together were cutting firewood, and there was, and I said, get the other end of that log. He said, yeah, I'll get it, boy. I remember the day when old Troy would have picked that up by himself, and before I even thought I was lost, I said, get out of the way, boy. Well, well, I grabbed it and picked it up and showed him. See how stupid that is? All he wanted was for me to do it. Y'all know what I was the next day? Like this. Now, you know what caused that? Pride. Pride. The devil of all people said to Jesus Christ, if you're really the Son of God, now don't y'all know that's a temptation? Can you imagine the power? He, he was talking to the person that created him. And he said, if you're really who you say you are, if ever there was a temptation, that would be it. And what did the Lord say? It is written, Thou shalt not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth up. And Satan tried two more different ways to get him, and each time what did he say? It is, it is written. He was in a hand-to-hand -hand battle with the devil. He pulled his sword out the word of God and cut the devil to pieces. And what did the devil do? Last he told him, Depart from me. Get him, Satan. And he took off, didn't he? What could the devil do when you're armed with the word of God? Nothing, folks. That's why the people of Philadelphia were in such a good state because what did they do? They stood on the Word of God. And, you know, we could just keep going on. John is just full of this stuff. But just, y'all read 1 John and, and you'll see it. And when you get to Revelation, you'll see over and over it says of the saints, they have the testimony of Jesus Christ and they keep the commandments. Every time. Testimony. In other words, they talk the talk and they walk the walk. Do they walk the walk perfect? No. They walk it in Him, depending on Him, and confessing all their failures, don't they? That's the Christian life. But I just want to show you real quick a couple things Paul said. Because there are those that would say, Paul never said any of this. But go over to uh, Romans chapter 5. In Romans 5, 5, Paul says, Hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given to us. So then where does this love come from? God. From God. It's a gift of the Holy Ghost. Then how do you and I get it? We depend on Him and ask for it. Folks, we, we come to God begging on Him. You know, we, I read earlier the note from Gabriella where she talked about the baptism of the Spirit. That's not hooping and hollering and rolling on the floors like these people do. That. That's God pouring out His Spirit to enable His people to do it. He's done it for 2,000 years. Has He poured it out in a mighty way in these last days? No, folks, we're in one of the worst conditions the church has ever been. It's never been this worldly. But what did He promise? He promised He would. Is the church going to be overcome by the world or is the church victorious? victorious. Then what's going to have to happen? The Lord's going to have to pour out His Spirit. Alright, go to Romans chapter 12. In Romans 12 verse 9, Paul says, Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. Isn't that exactly what we've been reading all along? Mm -hmm. Now when he says, let love be without dissimulation, that means don't counterfeit it. Have we been told point blank that love is a fruit of the Spirit? Yes. He said, by the love of the brethren, that's how you'll, you'll be a marker, right? Well, does the lost world see that? Does the professor see that? Yeah. So then what does he do? He imitates it. 
He, when I was growing up, we all watched wrestling in my neighborhood. Lonnie was here, Lonnie knows. We watched wrestling. I don't, anyway, and they had a character on wrestling that his name was Brother Love. He was a preacher. He wore a white suit, and they had him, of course, he just looked, he was greasy as all get out, right? <laughs> but they had him in this snow white suit, and he was so mean and rotten, but you know what he'd say at the end of everything he did? Pure. I love you. He'd say it like that, you know? In other words, they were making fun of what they see in the Christian church. Yeah. Is love fake? Yeah, yeah it's fake. Why? Because people see this is, a, this is a marker in it. So Paul said, don't let it be counterfeited. <clears throat> Go over to 1 Corinthians 7. In 1 Corinthians 7, 19, Paul sums all this up real well. They were fighting over circumcision or uncircumcision. In other words, they were fighting over the ordinances. And Paul said, circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. In other words, are either one of those important? No. Nope. What is important? But the keeping of the commandments of God. Now, do y'all see what the man said? He didn't say circumcision and uncircumcision is the keeping of the commandments. He said circumcision amounts to nothing. It's not important. Uncircumcision is not important. What is important? The keeping of the commandments of God. And, and but we could go on and on with this. Look. Hey, Paul says one other thing I'll just quote to you. He says in Galatians 5 that faith worketh by love. Faith works in love, doesn't it? What are the gifts? Faith, hope, charity, or love. Or does the Spirit ever give the person faith and then that faith not produce love? It's not real faith if it doesn't. You know, James said it this way. If a man says he's got faith and he doesn't have works to go along with it, the faith is fake, isn't it? And how did he prove that? He said, if you don't love your brother, it's not real. And what was his example? You see a brother or sister in Christ destitute of daily food and, and naked, and what do you say to them? I'll go home and pray for you. Have a good day. What does that prove? Your faith's not real. You see a brother or sister needing something, what do we do? We help them. If you can help them, we help them, don't we? Do we help them to get something back? Matter of fact, the Lord said, don't help that person. Help the one that can't do anything for you. There's your reward, isn't it? I was you do something for somebody and want them to do for you. You ain't done nothing. That's the world does that, don't they? Love your brother as Christ loved us. How much did Christ love us? He laid down His life for us. Folks, I want you all to think about His life. When I say He laid down His life, His life didn't begin on the cross. It ended on the cross. Where did His life begin at? How long did He lay down His life for us? 33 and a half years. Did He lay down every step of the way? Where was He heading? To Calvary? He did that for us? Then how should He and you treat each other? If Christ loved you enough to die for you, then I need to love you, don't I? He, I heard an old man say one time, you might not like me, but you better learn to love me because you're going to be with me for eternity if you're saved. Amen. If we're going to be together for eternity, we need to get, on to get, get along now, don't we? Get along okay. with it. Alright, any questions? Alright, well thank you all very much.